Hey everybody, welcome into the VolQuest Mailbag Podcast here at VolQuest.com and of course on the VolQuest YouTube channel. If you're on, if you're watching us on YouTube, go ahead and hit that like button. Help us get this video up to 500 likes so more of the VolQuest subscribers can see it. And of course, if you haven't, please subscribe to the channel as well. I'm Eric Kane, Austin Price, Brent Hubs, and Rob Lewis here with you today. Tennessee set to take on South Carolina Saturday at 7 o'clock. That game will be televised on ESPN, the Volunteers a chance to secure a 10-win regular season. So we got a full bank of questions. We'll go ahead and dive right down into it. We'll start with Doolittle Vol. How many of the following things must happen for Tennessee to be in the playoffs? UGA beats LSU, Ohio State beats Michigan, TCU loses a game, or USC loses a game. Austin Price, I think that if Tennessee gets two of those four, they're in amazing shape. I mean, I honestly think if if TCU loses, they're in amazing shape. You know, I I don't think that like um, I just I, I think there's a scenario where they would still get in over you know a, a Ohio State team that doesn't have the wins Tennessee does. Now they're going to have the name value, and Hubs pointed this out. And it's a good point. They for whatever reason, Ohio State has been you know, thought of and labeled as one of the top two teams all year. You know, early it was Alabama and Ohio State, then it switched to Georgia and Ohio State. Now, I mean, what have they done to earn that? Nothing. I mean, they're just the Ohio University. I mean, it's it's not like that they went out and won a bunch of games. Their best win right now is Notre Dame. So, in, in, in reality, they need Notre Dame to keep winning, which means that Notre Dame beats USC, which, again, is another one of those check-the-box type things for Tennessee to get in. Yeah, I, Rob, I think that when you look at that, the, the, the two that stands out to me is LSU doesn't need to beat Georgia because I think that makes it really interesting in the conference. And I think if you're a Tennessee fan, you're pulling hard for Ohio State because Michigan's strength of schedule is not real high and Ohio State has that recognition that they've had all year long. So if you're looking at those four scenarios, to me, those are the two that are the biggest for, for Tennessee. You do not need LSU to win and you need Ohio State to win. I just, I mean, I go round and round about it, but I just, if it, I mean, I'm not the playoff committee, but if it was me, I just think Tennessee needs to win out. I did, you know, if LSU were to beat Georgia, there's precedent for sending the, you know, a one loss team not in the conference championship to the title over the conference champ. What, what, how many years ago was it when Penn State did it? Uh, they, they were, they lost two games, but they won the big, they won the Big Ten championship game. Yeah, it's a couple years. And, yeah. and they beat, Unlike LSU, if I'm not mistaken, they beat Ohio State head to head that season, and Ohio yep. State still had one loss, and Penn, Penn State did not get in. That's a great. That that's a the, great point, and and something that I mean, wasn't discussed last night by the or Tuesday night, by the way, on the uh, it, on, on the on the rushed playoff announcement. Thanks to the double overtime game. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I was just going to say. I mean, you, you compare that precedent, which was set by the playoff committee, to what Tennessee did to LSU. You know, forty to thirteen on your home. I just, I just can't get past that. So that, that makes me not care what happens in Atlanta. I just here's a two part past, here. Can't get past Tennessee beating LSU forty to thirteen. I mean, and I don't think you could have been worse. You don't could think have easily been worse. I don't like USC. I mean, I get that USC. They play in Los Angeles or the Trojans. They have a, you know, just a gajillion, you know, parts of tradition. They're, and, and there, there's going to be a lot of people behind them on ESPN, you know, on, on talk radio. But their resume is – it's not going to stack up Tennessee's. I mean, that, Tennessee could still get – I don't want to say a, a bad word. They could get taken advantage of easily and, and not make it. But I just think of all the – no matter what happens, Tennessee's going to have the best resume of any one-loss team. Regardless of who gets in, this is kind of a, a two-parter here. You envision if it is Tennessee getting in, they will go to three to avoid the UGA matchup. And I, I would agree with that. I mean, that's something you've seen with no. Alabama and Georgia the last couple of years they've been in it. I, I don't think they want to rematch in the semifinals, Austin. Correct. But if the three that are undefeated, yeah, you know, I know there's technically four right now, but one of them is going to lose because they play each other. But if TCU remains undefeated, I think Tennessee, the best they could do is four. Yeah, I would agree with that. That would even though, even though you don't you don't but want yes, really a match a, a rematch in the semifinals. I don't think that if TCU has been ahead of Tennessee for multiple weeks and they went out, 
I don't think a one loss team is going to go ahead of one of the undefeated teams who are in the top four. I, I don't, I don't see that scenario happening. If they do, then I think the committee takes a lot of grief because it looks like they are manipulating matchups, which is one of the provisions that's not supposed to happen when you go through the selection of your four teams. But I do think if TCU loses, that Tennessee absolutely would be the three. Yeah, Let's go to Mid Tennessee VFL. Big picture, what's it been like inside the program this year compared to previous years and coaches and the long drought since 2007? Brent, you want to take this one? You've you've been around for all these coaching changes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, th- this is different because I, I the biggest thing for me and and Rob, I'll throw it to you with this is. Um, there's an identity in the program and, and there there's culture, the word that's used and all the things, but, but you know what you're getting in that program. There, there's an identity because there's been stability for two years. You've had success, uh, but you know what you are on offense. It's not this hodgepodge of stuff that seems to change week to week. You know what you're trying to be on defense. And I think given a group of kids, an identity goes a long way into creating that culture that everybody's talked to talk about. I think leadership deserves a ton of credit, but I also think you got to give some credit to the fact that they know who they are and what they're about and what they're supposed to be about on the field because of the, the, the identity has not changed since Josh Heupel's been here. Well, the, the biggest thing that strikes me is just kids are having fun. I mean, they, they, they like coming into the building. They, they come into the interview rooms with a bounce in their step. I mean, not that they're that, not that they love talking to the media. I'm just they they're just happy to be part of the program. Football is fun. They they like. I mean, I, I'm not saying that it's they're holding hands and singing "Kumbaya" around the campfire every night. But Josh Heupel has made this fun, and obviously, you know, winning makes everything better. Uh, it goes without saying. But I just think Heupel has his you know finger on the pulse of this program, and and kids have are, are completely bought in in a way we have not seen in a long long time brent let's go back to you here uh josh heupel uh not that josh heupel but uh what noticeable improvements have you seen in joe milton over the last two years and do you think it translates against real competition next season i, I don't know if there's a way we know that right now but he has looked good when he's been in yeah i mean i think that he's clearly more comfortable with the guys he's throwing the football to I think he's got a better feel for his receivers than what he had a year ago. I think he's got a better feel for the system and an understanding of the system. I think you still have the questions about, you know, where's the touch on the underneath stuff and uh, making some of those decisions and, um, you know, making quick decisions and all those things. Good Lord knows he can throw it a country mile. I mean, the throw to Squirrel White was ridiculous. I mean, just ridiculous. I thought the throw to Ramel Keaton was a better throw. Now, not, not not from a not from a physical talent standpoint, but when you're talking about what the question is here, the growth and, and the improvement of um, Joe Milton, I think the first thing that jumps out to you that way is that uh, he threw Ramel Keaton open. That ball wasn't late. It wasn't behind him. He knew Keaton had open grass to run to. He put it where the only guy who was going to catch that ball was Ramel Keaton. That's a throw we didn't see from him a year ago. His timing was good. His accuracy was good location, you know, and everything. He helped his receiver get even more open by the way he threw the football on that. And Brent, didn't he didn't he have to step up in the pocket, but he couldn't step into the throw because the rush was right there and he still put it on a dime? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think Joe Milton needs to step into anything unless unless the goal is to throw it the Tennessee River. I mean, I, I just don't think that and I don't think that's required that that he's got to really step into a throw to heave it. I mean, the the, the arm is the arm is just ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, from a talent standpoint, I mean, I mean, Pat Ryan, you know, I sat next to him in games and, and he just, we went to the break and he's like, every quarterback out there is so jealous of that. I mean, the ball never wobbles. It's a tight spiral and spiral and he just flicks his wrist. So, um, you know, that part's good. I, I think Joe, the other thing that I liked about Joe in the game on Saturdays, I liked the way he ran the option. Like, I, I thought mm-hmm. he didn't dance. He was decisive. He lowered his shoulder. He played with some physicality in the run game. So, I think Joe Milton is getting better. Is he going to step in and be a seamless replacement for Hendon Hooker next year? No, I'm not saying that. But but I do think you're seeing a real growth out of Joe Milton in year two in this system. Well, what I really enjoyed is is when he got out there and he ran the ball. 
I mean, a year ago, he didn't look to use that big frame and, and, and get hit at all. And this year, I mean, he's lowering his shoulder and trucking people. Like, to me, that uh, that's the biggest thing I notice. I mean, yeah, he's hit some deep balls, and he overshot him last year and all that. But, you know, it, it's just kind of how he's, how he's handling himself and his ability to use his frame to his advantage. Rob, there's still those moments, though, where that ball comes out about 7,000 miles an hour on a five-yard out. Like, like he, he still has to channel some of that stuff a little bit. But I, I do think he's made a step forward. Yeah, I do too. And again, we've seen him against you know second team defenses, and when when it didn't matter in games, but he he just looks way more comfortable to me. Small sample size, and again, no pressure when he's in there. But I, I mean, it's it's got me very curious to see what he looks like next next fall. Uh, two porter, real quick though. Um, kind of on this note with Joe Milton, is there any type of scenario to where you could see Nico stepping in and playing? And and I think a lot of that is. Well, what's Joe Milton look like? What's the progression of Taven Jackson? Um, you don't want that to happen, but there's always that scenario, right, Austin? Yeah, I mean, what's Taven Jackson going to do, right? Yeah. I mean, Nico's coming in, you know, uh, is he going to still be here? I mean, I guess maybe. We'll see. Um, you know, but I mean, you know, quarterbacks are, are very finicky. Very few are willing to just sit there and, you know, kind of be patient and, and, and you know, play their role. I do think it's easier, you know, if Joe Milton's going to be the guy. And I think we all agree that he's going to be given the first chance to be Tennessee's starting quarterback in 2023. But, uh, you know, to kind of understand, hey, there's a pecking order here. But, uh, you know, I, I'm interested to kind of see the dynamics of that quarterback room come, let's say, May, right after spring ball. Well, I mean, the question for me is, is Taven Jackson going to stay through spring ball? You know, um, I, I would guess that he that he would and, and make a decision after that. Um but, you, you, you know, you'll get an idea of what Nico can do in spring practice and, and see, you know, kind of where that's at. We'll see where, where Joe's at. How does Joe handle spring practice? Does he feel pressure? Does he play a little bit tight like we saw at the at the beginning of last year? Or does he – is he confident and kind of settle down and, and, and go about his business in spring ball the way that it looks like he's playing right now? You don't know the answer to that. I mean, Joe Milton knows he's not in a co quarterback competition right now. He's going to know come April he's going to be in a quarterback competition. You know, how does he handle that mentally? How does Nico handle that mentally? He's never been in a quarterback competition before. Those things you just don't know. So it, that, that'll make April interesting for sure. And for that matter, Taven Jackson has never been in a quarterback competition before because he never was in high school and he wasn't this year. So Yep, that's true. Let's go to Shell Ray 14. Rob Lewis, why do people still try to downplay Tennessee's success on the season by saying Tennessee hasn't played anyone or saying – Tennessee was dominated by Georgia. The way the game looked on TV doesn't match the stats or final score at all. I think Tennessee was getting some respect on Tuesday night, don't yeah, you? I, I've not heard anybody say that, so I don't, I don't know what to do with that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think anybody's suggesting Tennessee hasn't played anybody. I mean, you know, when you look at the number of ranked teams that they played, I, I don't think that's the case. Now, are, I mean, are people saying they were dominated at Georgia? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people have said that, it, you know, and you can you can look at that several different ways, depending on how you want to how you want to quote spin that one. Georgia won and was in control of the football game, but a lot of that was Tennessee's self, you know, Tennessee's own doing to give Georgia control of that football game. In my opinion, not everybody agrees with that opinion. A lot of people think that Tennessee was manhandled from start to finish. I, I kind of think that, and I think it doesn't matter. I mean, you tell me who who would have gone down there on that Saturday in that environment. What would USC have done? I mean, the, the teams were arguing about. What would USC have done that day? What Michigan would have got their doors blown off? I mean, yeah, I don't think anybody that, was winning in Stanford Stadium that no, day. No, I, I don't either. I think I think Tennessee got their tail whipped, and sure, Tennessee hurt itself an awful lot. But you know, why was that? Well, the environment. Well, the the defense going up against. I mean, Georgia had a lot to do with that as well. So it just kind of I mean, is Georgia, what it is. Georgia threw four passes in the second half of that game. After after Stetson Bennett threw for two hundred twenty five yards in, in the first half, so and Tennessee was think, inside. Tennessee was inside Georgia's forty yard line six times. We got no points. I mean, I don't think you. Could, I mean, you know what I mean, I'm Tennessee, saying. I mean, go ahead. I mean, I mean, I was just gonna say they got whipped, but to me that doesn't. I mean, every, everybody in college football would have got whipped that day. I mean, no, I just I don't think it's they. You know, Georgia dominated them at home in Athens, so Tennessee's no good. I don't think that's the case at all. Hendersonville Vol 15, 
Allison Price, your weekly David Hobbs update. What is it? Um, same stat, same status that I'll have in the war room Friday. Um, and that I've been saying for the last couple of weeks, the, nothing, you know, Georgia made a huge run. They passed Alabama, but they've done nothing in my mind to pass Tennessee. I felt like Tennessee was the team to beat for at least, uh, you know, four to six weeks. And I still think they are. I mean, you know, I don't do the crystal ball prediction stuff. So everybody can percentage? Everybody can percentage. They probably want to read them. AP, you have a percentage? No percentage. I, I, you know, man, I, you know, when you talk to these kids, I don't think it's fair. Nashville 615 1615 wants to try this again. The offensive line has given up 10 sacks the last two games. What does the in season, oh, I didn't read this before. Sorry, guys. Workout program look like to ensure team strength and physicality <laughs> doesn't drop off. The team looked more sound in the earlier season games. I don't think the strength and conditioning program has anything to do with why Tennessee's given up 10 sacks in the last two weeks of uh, uh, Brent Hubs. No. No, I mean, ten- Tennessee's not dropped off in strength levels. They've suddenly not become weak. Um, they, they Have they played their, their best from a pass protection up front? No. Is all that on the offensive line? No. Part of that's on running backs sometimes. Some of it's part on of Hooker. That, part of that's on tight ends, and part of that's on Hooker sometimes as well. So um, th- they played two really good defensive fronts. Um, but I, I don't think that suddenly after Darnell Wright handled Will Anderson Jr., that he lost a bunch of strength levels because uh, of something with with a weight room deal. I just I don't believe that. So Hubbard, Hubbard, I, I don't think you, that's you an don't, issue. I just don't think I don't think they played particularly well in pass pro the last two weeks, and I think that they'll get they'll get themselves right started this week. I, I don't Let's know. Let's go AP, to Javante Sprague has missed arm day a couple weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> you, you knew, we were, you knew we were doomed on that question. When Eric said Nashville 615. 615, 615. I read the first part of the question, but then I I, I didn't get to the strength and conditioning bar. And I remember the Monday night chat. And I'm like, oh man, I, I would have skipped this one, but had to get it in there. Uh let's go to Fogman 615. With South Carolina's lack of run defense, does Hooker have a chance to pad his pass yardage and touchdown totals, Rob Lewis? Yes. Yes. I think it's it's one of those – I don't think South Carolina is very good at defending the pass either. It's just that, that age-old question, of, are they so bad at defending the run that that's just what people do against them? Hayden Hooker's going to throw for what, whatever Josh Heupel wants him to throw for, 250, 275, 300. They'll, they'll, they'll move up and down the field on South Carolina. Well, and that, and that was kind of the thing I said in the when we taped the uh, Rocky Top Roundtable is, you know – where Florida ran all over them last week, you know, Tennessee's probably going to have some opportunities there, but you know, when you're trying to pad the stats for a guy in a Heisman campaign, it'll be interesting to kind of see how they, I don't think they're going to do anything that, that hurts the the flow of the offense, but you know, if it's, if it's either, or I, I'd say the ball is going in. It's, it's a great Smith, place for Sorry, go ahead, Rob. I'm just I'm sorry to interrupt you, AC. It's just I mean I can't remember if it's if it was AP or Hubbard that made this point, but it being in this position, whether you're talking about style points for the playoff or, or Heisman run, Tennessee doesn't have to get out of character to for him to throw for 350 yards or to score 60 yeah. points. I mean, that's that's how they play. Yeah, you guys remember the uh the the guy in the, what was that movie? Uh rookie of the year or where's the where's the one where the 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 kid fixes his arm and he can throw it a gazillion miles an hour. Yeah, rookie of the year. Okay, rookie of the year. All right, his shoulder goes out and he's playing – he's throwing to the guy at the end when the ball's floating in. He's got his tongue stuck out. He's getting ready. That's Alex Golish and Josh Heupel when they see single safety high. Okay? And if South Carolina is going to commit to the run because they're giving up 190 yards and they're going to bring single safety high and give man coverage, I can promise you the ball's going over the top of somebody because that's what Tennessee – that's what Tennessee loves. Are you – are you – you're telling me that the Gullish and Hype aren't going to look out there, hitting a hooker, and go. No, I don't think there's, I don't think they're going to float it, AP. That's what they're going to tell Joe Milton next year on all passes within five yards. <laughs> float it. Yeah. Now they might do that, but um, I, I just think they're licking their chops anytime they see single safety high. When they got that look against Missouri, I mean, they, they set a school record for yards, right? Yes, they ran it well and they were effective running the football, but they threw it wherever they wanted to throw it because. They get so many matchups that they want to, that they can win in when they get that defensive look in the secondary. That's why Eric, the run game you know, is so important. 
Eric, do you know what movie we're talking about? 100%, dude. I'm a huge baseball guy. And I'll tell you this right now. Brent Hubb's favorite baseball movie ever is Angels in the Outfield. Am, am I right, Brent? <laughs> no, it's not. That's not the case at all. I've never because seen Because why, Brent? Why? I've never seen that movie. I don't know anything about oh. Angels in the Outfield. Because it's it's a movie not about baseball, right? I, I don't know. I've never seen the movie, right? Uh, Hubbard's anti-Gordon uh, uh, Levitt, and so he's never seen that movie. <laughs> oh, Field of Dreams is definitely a movie not about baseball. You're okay, a baseball guy? Back. I didn't know you were a baseball guy, Kane. Yeah, me neither. Um, let's go to Sam Smith, 22, 30, 33, with the transfer portal opening on in December. If Tennessee makes the college football playoff, would guys still enter the portal or would they want to hold off until spring? Oh, I, think guys, I think guys are going to enter the portal, AP. I mean, I, I mean, you, when that window hits, you're looking for a place to play. Doesn't mean you're leaving. I mean, I don't know that Josh Heupel would tell somebody they've got to, they've got to be gone. But I think when that window hits in December, there's some guys – who are going to hit that portal deal because you, you can't go into that portal dur during the, you know, during the early part of spring. So you, you don't want to get stuck and, and not have a place to play. So I think if you're looking to leave, regardless of whether you're in the playoff hunt or not, I think you're going to go ahead and get in that portal so you can see what all opportunities are out there for yourself. Yeah, it, it, you're right. And it, it provides an interesting dynamic because I think that it's going to put some guys in a tough spot because I think some want to play the whole like, you know, we need the NIL deal, you know, you know, strong arm, you know. But you really go do that when you're potentially in the playoff. Like, it just puts – it. there's a lot of interesting dynamics about that window in December, in my opinion. We'll go to West Tennessee. Mike, a couple of questions here. Out of the three freshman cornerbacks coming in next year and Conyer, Gibson, and Matthews, which has the best shot Jordan at Matthews. playing time? Jordan Matthews, I would agree. Uh, who was the best Memphis area kid to play at Tennessee? That's a good question for Ooh, you guys. Ooh, that is a good question. Ooh, of all Man. time? I don't know. I don't know of all time. I can go back in the way back machine here and look at my. And we're we're we are definitely not counting Jackson as Memphis area, or we because that's important because it takes Al Wilson out of the equation. Yeah, I mean we're not going to count him, right? Because that's I mean, that's, not, a, that's that's not that's ninety miles away. Yeah, so, so we're not going to Memphis area. Oh, Man. let's see here. I mean, there's no, you can go to the next question while I what I, I was going to say. I'm we'll just, we'll, we'll, we'll skip Seth ahead here. What do you guys there. think? Much like <laughs> Hyatt, Jalen Wright, and Dylan Sampson were considering speed demons coming out of high school. Why are we seeing Sampson and Wright getting chased down from behind in the open field, Austin? Well, I think a lot of those times that the guys had an angle on them. You know, I I don't remember a time where like so they went and got hawked down by someone who was just out of position. You know, um, you know, and right. I, you know, we've not seen enough of of Dylan Sampson, in my opinion, to to warrant that. Sam, no, no, go back and watch Sampson's run Saturday. Yeah, he was in the open field some, but like he was never he he never was clear of someone who you know didn't have an angle on him. Now, and he was off. He was Dylan off Ryan, balance. I did kind of wonder why he didn't get bigger. And you know, not this past Saturday, but in previous games. Yeah, Rob, Rob, you make a good point. I mean, Sampson was when, when he got in the open field and made a guy miss. He, he, you know, he was off bat, lost his balance a bit, lost a little bit, lost some speed there. I, I don't think there's any concerns about Dylan Sampson's speed if he can get in the open field. Um, there's look, Missouri's solid tackling team, and they, they played with their safeties played with good angles and and made plays there. So I, I don't think that. I don't suddenly go, wow, he's not got breakaway speed because I, I think he's plenty fast enough. All right, looking at the Memphis question here, um, Andre Lott, Cedric Wilson, Corey Stone was a solid player at Tennessee. I, here, here's one for you. Um, Steve White, the late Steve White, was a really good player at Tennessee. Dan Williams, Rob Lewis, one of your all-time favorites, is a Memphis Love native. Dan I, Williams. I put him in that list. Where's Malcolm on? Rawls at, Hubs? Malcolm Rawls? He's with Cam Clear. That that's who they took. They took they took Dan Williams. Always works out that way, man. The, the, Remember the that? throw in the throw in that always ends up being better than the, the guy that they covered. I mean, well, for I mean, all the guys that they've gotten out of Memphis, it's I mean, it's I mean, I'm and there have been good players, but they're I mean, there's not been superstars, you know, like you would like you would think for the sheer amount of numbers that have come through. 
Yeah, and give a hey, give a shout out to the great Tommy Hutton at at the punter position. Played a long time in the NFL as well. Memphis native. HS Ball, where would you rank Hendon Hooker in terms of all time quarterback ranks at Tennessee? Uh, it's a question that's been thrown around a lot lately with the year that he's having. Well, I mean, when you I'm look going- at st- statistically, he's he's what Rob? I mean, statistically, he's probably number two, right? I think he is number two. Now, had Heath stayed for that senior year, different conversation. Yeah, the game's but he, different. But he didn't. I mean, oh, it's way different. Know, way different. I mean, where would Heath Schuler have been in this offense? Or or Peyton, for that matter. Even though he wasn't a dual threat guy. I mean, if Peyton threw it like they do here. But, yeah, I, I mean, we've talked about this before. He sure was 20 years before his top. Yeah, for sure. I mean, he, he did things that, I mean, he could have been Johnny Manziel when Johnny Manziel changed the game. I mean, it, had he played in, in this era in the way that they – the way they do things now at the quarterback position with, with, with RPOs, basketball. RPOs yeah. and design runs. I mean, he would be, I mean, I don't, I don't want to get crazy, but I mean, just physically hover and you, you were around then he, physically, he may, may have been the best that, that's been through here. When you talk about legs and arm and, and just as an athlete, Let's go to Nashville Ball 615. There's a ton of mid-state 615s and, and Ball 615s in here today. Which players do you think change positions when spring practice rolls around? Seems like Tennessee's had success doing that in years past. I think the obvious question there, Austin, awesome, would be some of those players that might be candidates to switch positions might also be candidates for the transfer portal. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Um, it'd be interesting to see – you know, kind of who does what. I I just don't see a whole lot of moving around because, you know, kid, your kids just don't want to move positions. You know, they, they want to play what they want to play. Um, Jimmy Holiday could have moved to the secondary. He doesn't want to do that. He wants to play wide receiver. Now, does he stick around? What what happens there? Um, you know, so I, I think there are some candidates, but they're also, to me, it's, those are just more candidates to head to the portal. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't know that there's many candidates. I mean, would you if D. Williams can't play corner? Do you look at him as a specialty offensive player? Yep. May, maybe. You know, I don't know that he can play receiver, but do you look at something from a specialty standpoint with him? Maybe. But but how many other guys are legitimate candidates to to flip to another position? Is I don't a, see those young receivers Cam, going to defense. Is Cam Miller home at safety? That'd be that'd, that'd be the only one that. I think so. I don't think he's moving back to the offensive side of the ball. Yeah, I mean, so I, I don't I don't think there's a ton of options in looking at guys who could potentially move. Now, you know, does somebody grow into you know from an outside defensive end guy to a, an inside pass rusher deal like we've seen a little bit of Tyler Barron? Yeah, but that's not really a position. That's not like what this guy's talking about in terms of flipping guys from one side of the ball to the other. Yeah, like Kevin Burnett came in as a safety and then finished his career obviously at linebacker. So, I mean, I don't think that there's – anybody like that right now but that could always happen i mean aaron beasley's been all over the place princeton fans been all over the place throughout his career so fan for life does crawford or mincy get a look at right tackle next year i don't think gerald mincy because he's left tackle all the way yeah i could see crawford getting getting a look there i mean they've got to find an answer at at right tackle because i don't see darnell Wright coming back for another year um unless you know he does not get an nfl grade that i think he's going to get based on the way he's played this year uh, so they've got to find an answer at right tackle, and I think he would start by taking a look at Crawford at right tackle in the spring. I think le- I think Mincy's a left guy all the way. What is Addison Nichols? AP guard. Uh, I think he's a right tackle or a guard. Okay, he could be right tackle. He could be a factor at right tackle in the spring as well. But I think probably a guard. Squatch underscore Vol. What does it take at this point for Hendon Hooker to win the Heisman? I. I if I think Shroud has to have a kind of just okay game against Michigan, um, and then you, you hope that the, the running back – see, I think the dark horse there is Corum, the running back from Michigan. If he was to have a huge game against Ohio State and let's say Michigan wins, I think he vaults hard. Um, but I think just kind of an okay game against Michigan, but Ohio State wins, um, that might, you know – that might help. But, I mean, again, when does the voting take place, Hubbard? This is, to me, the most open Heisman 
build in a long, long time. When the, I would imagine most people are going to wait until after the championship games to do the voting. Yeah, I think they'll wait as long as they can. But, you know, I'm not saying Hendon can't win it, but uh, I have a hard time seeing him move past, you know, uh, Strout with if, if he plays well against Michigan. I, I just – I think I think right now the guy who's in the catbird seat, if he goes out and performs well in, in, a, in a big game with everything on the line, uh, is C.J. Shroud at, at – at uh, Shrout at, at Ohio State in that Michigan game. Is Andre Turrentine just not ready to play with all that's happened this year? Surprised he never got some run. How many balls do you expect to enter the transfer portal as well? I mean, there's no way to know that number. Um, you know, I would say at least six. You know, I, 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 and I think you're probably bringing in at least six guys out of the portal. Um, could be more, could be less. Uh, you know, there are kids every day that threaten that they're going in at schools across the country and then never do. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens. But I think you're looking at at least five to six that go in. Um, and I think Tennessee takes at least five to six out of the out of the transfer portal. And as for Turrentine, I mean, I, I think you got to understand that he's still young. He doesn't have a ton of playing experience. He's coming into a new system um, and was behind two veteran safeties. Um, I think there's I think there's people in the program that feel like Andre can play and is going to help this team. And I think this is a, a huge opportunity for him in the spring after being in, in Tim Banks' system for a year. So we'll see what that looks like in the spring with, with Andre Turrentine. Lee Creek with the turmoil at Auburn. Any chances that Jeremiah Cobb reopens his recruitments? Uh, any more running back targets to be on the lookout for outside of Khalifa? Um, he took the visit to Georgia. I still don't see it. I think he ends up signing with Auburn. The only, the only way that that gets dicey with Auburn is if Auburn runs Cadillac Williams out of town. Yep, 100%. Yeah, you know, now, what's going to be fascinating at Auburn is this push that the current players are trying to get going out there for Cadillac Williams. I don't think Cadillac Williams is going to get the job at Auburn, Rob Lewis. I, I don't I don't think he can – I mean, even if he wins the Iron Bowl, I don't see him being the head coach at Auburn. I guess crazier things have happened. It is Ooh. Auburn. But, but, but I, don't, I don't know that he gets that job. If he doesn't get the job, does the new coach coming in have to keep him? Is that part of the deal? And does Cadillac Williams want to stay at, at Auburn if he doesn't get the job? You know, that that would be the only dynamic with Cobb is is the Cadillac Williams. Because I think he and Cadillac Williams have such a, a really good relationship, Austin. I, if he's there, I think Cobb's at Auburn. I agree. The, the more that thing kind of gets, you know, starts kind of getting going down the tracks, the more – you wonder if he's going to get his feelings hurt, you know, if he doesn't get a legit shot and a, and a, and a real look there, because I'm going to tell you that would happen here, you know, and, 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 and so like, that's going to be one of those interesting dynamics that, you know, you, you better handle that thing with kid gloves or you could end up losing him, um, you know, somewhere else because he feels like he was slighted because he wasn't giving, given a legit chance and a legit shot at the job. And, you know, I, 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 that that whole thing is fascinating to me. That the, the last Saturday night, and all the, the post game interview, and I know Cole's doing. It, he's an Auburn guy, right? I mean, if, if, it'd be the same if Tennessee. They had, if this happened here, and he's been interviewed by a Tennessee guy, but like the media interviewing the players on the field, like 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 they just won the national title. Yeah, like I mean, that's I the kind of stuff that happens after massive wins. I mean, you beat a terrible, terrible, terrible Texas A and M team. By a three, and 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 they're, you know, you know the the light show and and all the rocking back and forth in the stands. It just was a bit much for me. Let's end on this one. Cass Walker wants to know why is there virtually no faking of injuries this season when no new rules were passed in the off season? Is there some sort of unwritten rule or gentlemen's agreement uh, between teams now this year? I'm waiting for Hubbard's answer. I just. Uh... I mean, are, you think Greg Sankey just made a bunch of phone calls and said, "Hey guys, you don't want to deal with me. Don't do it." Uh, I, I don't. You know, I, I don't. I don't know. Um, is I and mean, we'll start with Ole Miss, right? Because that's that's the one who we, we all saw it a year ago, and, and we know that that was part of it. Um, they've there been they've been a couple of times where they've had that happen to them. Is Ole Miss doing less of that this year because they're better on defense, right? I mean, they're they're, they're getting more stops on defense, that type of thing. I think it's happening some. 
I don't think it's just as blatant as it was for, for whatever reason. I don't know if coaches were kind of embarrassed by it. I don't know if I, I don't know. I mean, Greg Sankey can put the fear of the Lord in him, but but what's the punishment? Like, you know what I'm saying? Was he gonna do suspend somebody? Like I, I don't I don't know the answer to that question, but it certainly seems much less of a part of defense's game plans as as we've seen you know, in, in previous years. Now, I'll say this too. I mean, with the exception of Tennessee, how many teams are going warp speed in this league right now? Ole Miss not playing Ole as Miss. fast. They're not playing as fast as they did a but, year ago or but, as, as much as they did with Matt Corral. But those are the only one. I mean, that's the only one I would even say, you know, tinkers with that style. Yeah, agreed. And, and so maybe that's, right, maybe that's part of it too, right, is you just don't have as many opportunities. I mean, Arkansas is clearly not playing as fast as they have previously. Maybe that's part of it. I don't know the answer. I think it's a good question. I, I don't know the answer to that. But there will be some type of rule change at some point this offseason or next offseason. They didn't make a rule because they didn't – They didn't they say they didn't have enough time to come up I mean, with a rule? I mean, there's something will be in a rule yeah, book but, about this to address well, it. What's it going to be? I mean, if, if it's not a national problem, if it's not the discussion point this year that it was a year ago, that, is there any rule that really comes into play? Or they just say, hey – it's getting better. We're just not going to put because the problem is what's the rule? I mean, how do you how do you govern it? How do you? I mean, who's hurt? Who's not hurt? You can't accuse a kid of faking an injury. You yeah, just I mean, can't I, get sued. Not, not in this day and age, you're, you're not yeah. going to do that. I, I think the only thing you could do would be not allow coaches you know, coaches to huddle up with their teams while a trainer is going out to see an injured player. <laughs> Outside of that, I'm not sure what else you can do from a rule standpoint. All right, that's going to do it here for today's edition of the Mailbag Podcast. Appreciate all you guys for getting in all your questions and uh, comments here this week. Got to the majority of them, but uh, every Wednesday, uh, every Tuesday and Wednesday, get in your questions. We pin it at the top of the GQ, and uh, that's how we do it here on a Thursday Mailbag Podcast. For Awesome Price, Brent Hubs, and Rob Lewis, I'm Eric Kane. If you're watching, hit that like button, subscribe to the VolQuest YouTube channel, and stay tuned to VolQuest.com for plenty of coverage. It's crossover season, basketball, hoop stock, and of course, Tennessee at South Carolina coming up Saturday at 7 o'clock. Appreciate you guys for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your Thursday, everybody.